Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I come to you again today with the astounding, superb news uh, regarding a couple things. We've got some interesting stuff going on with the uh, website has not been updating. I have fallen off the update wagon. I will get back on that as soon as possible. Um, but in good news, uh, Pedrop was telling me yesterday night he's only got about 15 more seconds to animate for Rainbow Dash Presents. So he's going to send that off to me very soon, at which point I will go ahead and I'll finish up all the background music for it, get that all edited in there, do a final render, upload it online, and then uh, we should be good to go. Uh, since we've joined the network, we'll get the advertisements on there right away, as opposed to in a month from now, or never, and, uh, and that'll be great. That will be good, and then we'll get to start work on our parody of Equestria Girls, uh, wherein the characters will become simians. Because uh, that is what happens when you go through magical mirrors in the Crystal Kingdom, although we don't have the Crystal Kingdom established in the Mentally Advanced Universe. I don't know if we will... We'll probably not do anything with that, but we might have Cadence showed up. It depends. I've got a guy who does a voice, which I like, uh, which we might use for Cadence, and it just depends on uh, what we decide to do for time. The current episode going up is actually... Um, It'll be good, but there's been there's been a lot cut from it. Uh, if we had included everything that would have been in there, it probably would have been about like an hour long. As it turns out, there was uh, there was a whole lecture that Sweetie Belle was going to give on sensible behavior that uh, that had to be cut. It's been shortened significantly, and and uh, stuff like that. We we're going to go into background on uh, on Dinky and Derpy and their family relationship and things like that. And that kind of had to be cut a little bit. We were going to talk more about Dash's family, and had to be cut. So we just we've had a lot of stuff that was planned, and a lot of uh, a lot of cutting to make the thing like fit within a half hour. So uh, it's been, this one's been, I think, our longest. Uh, uh, as Peter says, not our longest production time, but it's taken the longest to get this one online, uh, just because there's been. Uh, a lot going on in both of our lives, uh, moving around, uh, stuff with school, financial troubles, uh, better ups going to Vancouver, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so yes, it's, it's the end of a long road with Rainbow Dash Presents. This will be up very soon, uh, potentially next week, I hope. Uh, we have said this sort of thing before and have been wrong, so don't, uh, don't absolutely hold me to it. But, but uh, uh, you may maintain a glimmer of hope in your breast. Now, uh, uh, the other thing that I've done is I've actually been invited, and this I'm kind of excited for, to do an alpha playtest sort of thing, and also promotional material for a new game, uh, which as I understand, if I understand correctly, it's a survival uh, horror MMO. And uh, where you, it's kind of, I think it's a first person shooter sort of thing, but not exactly. It's like you're traveling around a hostile wasteland environment, um, like New Vegas, but full of demons and other horrible creatures, I, I suppose, from the screenshots as far as I can tell. And uh, you can make friends, but I think that everyone is potentially hostile. Uh, I'm going to be playing with uh, some of the other guys from my network, and they are probably going to kill me. If not, I might follow them around and annoy them, annoy them with Rainbow Dash voice. It depends on, depends on what they tolerate from me. I think more likely they're going to shoot me in the head. Uh, yeah, so but that'll be fun though, and I'll, I'll be posting uh, not exactly let's plays for that because it's an alpha The game devs don't know what we're gonna run into We're supposed to be reporting if we if we stumble into any glitches or we have a problem then we're supposed to report to them So uh, we have to submit the videos and like if we if we have uh, If we have a glitch like they don't want us to be showing the glitches uh, in in the videos because it's a promotional sort of thing so they don't want, they're like they're just like we'll fix the glitch like don't don't show people it's show us the glitch we'll fix it because uh, it's due it's due to come out I think uh, next month so this is they're gonna they're gonna fix any uh, mistake they think that there shouldn't be really anything large but like I say they just they just didn't want to have us uh, going into the alpha and giving people the wrong impression about the stability of the game because it's playable now. And, uh, and, you know, obviously there are a bunch of people with early access, but, uh, but, but yeah, they just, they just want us to, to do it. So instead of a, like, instead of a let's play format, what I'm probably going to do is like journal entries. Like I'll travel around and narrate and talk about the stuff that I do and it'll all be sort of like Queen Latifah, you know, my, uh, my naive stumbling adventure through this, through this wasteland scenario. But uh, anyway, so that'll be fun. That'll probably be up online, uh, ideally well before the, the end of the month. Since uh, since it launches next month, and uh, uh, what else? That's it for that. Uh, uh, today I was gonna I said I was gonna talk about biochemistry, but actually I changed my mind. Uh, last week while I was at work, I was thinking instead about a role playing game that I was in, and I thought that this would be actually a more fun story than biochemistry. Biochemistry is interesting. I I will still come back to that and do that, but uh, but just this this was something that I wanted to talk about. 
was uh, was way back in the day my very first role-playing game and role-playing games if you don't know what they are they are basically it's like interactive storytelling one of your friends is in charge of the story and he tells you what's going on he tells you what all the other characters are doing and then you and your friends are characters within the story and you tell the game master what exactly it is that you're going to do and he tells you how the world responds to your actions and so forth and and between the group of you you make a new story and it's a lot of fun it's actually a great deal of fun, especially if you've got a lot of creative people. Some people are not as creative for it, and they prefer systems that kind of reflect that. They, there'll be systems that focus more on combat and, uh, and things like that. Like you'll read, like, uh, every, every role-playing book is often quite large. This is about the typical size that you would see on a book. This is actually a Warhammer 40k rule book, but most gaming books come in about this size. Uh, what the books will be full of is if they are a very mechanics-based game where they don't expect you to be too terribly creative, it'll be full of rules for combat and special moves and things like that. Uh, if it is a story-based game, the books will be cover-to-cover -cover history on the setting that you're supposed to be playing in. And we had a game that I liked very much called Children of the Sun. And Children of the Sun was just a, was just a beautiful game. The setting was was kind of interesting. It was, uh, as my friend described it, it was called diesel punk. It was a diesel punk setting, which is like World War II era, but with a high fantasy backdrop. So like there's magic, but instead of learning to use combustion engines and whatnot, they're starting to learn how to make functional engines out of, uh, out of magic. You know, like you can power a car with magic and it's becoming a mundane and people are starting to get educations, you know, routine educations in magic so they can produce contraptions and whatnot that run. And it's not like, uh, it's not like steampunk where everything is steam powered. It's, it's very much more uh, industrial. Like, uh, and you get stuff like the, the, the child labor and meat packing industry and all the horrible stuff. And, and so it's all very much like oppressive. It's sort of more like the 19... Maybe, maybe more around, think like the 1920s, when the world, when industrialism is starting to become a thing, and uh, and there's there's like robber barons and whatnot, and the rich are the you know the rich have never been richer, and there was a, a big war that that took place. Uh, it was it was like post post World War, uh, post World War One maybe era, something like that. But anyway, technology was in a big boom, and it was all magic based. And, uh, and there were a bunch of different races that you could play as, bear people, wolf people, uh, cat people, and they all had different kind of behaviors. They had different idiosyncrasies. And there were, there's also tree people, and the tree people were functionally immortal. There were elves, but the elves were on the decline because their, their main country was called, or they had two countries, Eltherion and, not Crace, Lycerial. But Lycerial had launched a giant war campaign on the rest of the world at large, they had, they had uh, started building demon engines and whatnot, so instead of just your typical magic, they were infusing demons into war machines and then sending those war machines to other countries and trying to conquer them through these demon machines. And uh, the problem with the demon machines is that as the elves began to lose the war, the demon machines were being broken on their home territory. And sometimes this caused the demons to get out and they would be strong enough to stick around and really wreak havoc. They were also doing strange breeding campaigns where they were they were breeding people with demons so that they would have like partially demonic offspring and then they would train that offspring to be super soldiers. And they got to these really powerful demons called Fel Knights, which were not always terribly loyal, but they were incredibly difficult to stop. And, uh, and armies of the things could pretty much just, you would need like a group of five of them to wreck an army. They were, they were incredible. But because they were so dangerous, they were also not widely, uh, I mean, they took breeding, they had to grow up, they had to go from being children to adults and everything else. So it wasn't like, it, they never really got it too terribly well off the ground. And then when the war collapsed, these demon lords kind of just took over most of Lyceria. So Lyceria is like a ruined wasteland, and it's surrounded by screaming angry souls and everything else. It's a terrible place, and most of the elves have died, except for those that live in Eltherion, who are outnumbered by their slaves. And so there's also a ton of potential for things like cultural revolution and, and stuff like that. We once did a slavery campaign where we, we played as like lower, lower, the lower echelons of the upper class. They were like the, the, the guys who, the enforcers for the rich out in Altherion. And, and that was a lot of fun. In the end, everyone got screwed because that's how it happens. That's what goes on in Altherion. But uh, yes, so... The very first game I ever played, though, was in this setting, in the Children of the Sun setting. 
but it was run by people I will refer to everyone as their character names because characters came and went they dropped like flies because uh, Adam Sandler who is who was the name of the character of the guy who ran the game who's actually Adam Sandler Adam Sandler the fifth distant relative to acting legend Adam Sandler Adam Sandler the fifth was uh, he didn't read the book. He took a look at the size of this thing and was like, that's like a textbook. There's no way I'm going to read up on all that history and important information on this game. And he just made it up as he went. In fact, he knew so little about the rules that at times things were just utterly beyond broken. We got into weird stuff like he had the magical engines and he had no idea. The game explained all these rules for these magical engines. It was like, these are how they're designed and these are what they do and these are some of the problems that they have. So like if your characters specialize in making these kind of engines, you need to be aware as the game leader um, how these engines can create problems for the players and uh, what kind of things like that. You could make the demon engines if you really wanted to, but there were a lot of problems with making the demon engines. And so like, you know, Adam Sandler didn't really pay attention to any of that. He just kind of made it up, which was disastrous. It was utterly disastrous. So I would like to tell you guys the story of Children of the Sandler is what we came to call it because uh, it really wasn't Children of the Sun anymore. It was just Children of it was the Children of Adam Sandler, and I do not even kid. Eventually, the game got to be about Adam Sandler settling down with a Catwoman wife and having like 50 kids, and then being worshipped as the king of his own nation, while the rest of us just got wrecked on a daily basis doing his dirty work. It was it was the most frustrating game. And we took our frustrations out on, on uh, Adam in so many different ways. Uh, it, was, it was fun at times and terrible at others. And we had a lot of people that would just come and go. And they would show up for a little while and they would be like, I hate Adam Sandler. And they would just leave because it was, it was just frustrating like that. It was like, I made a character and then he died in the first day. And uh, yes, so. It'll probably be, I will just establish the intro, and then this will be like a multi-series thing, and whatever I feel like talking about Children of the Sandler, we will add another part to Children of the Sandler, this will be part one. So, uh, how the game begins, picture yourself in the misty port town of a place in the wilds known as the All Thing. The All Thing, uh, it doesn't matter what the All Thing was supposed to be, because Adam Sandler hadn't read the rules, but in theory it was supposed to be an area of the wilds. A sort of Somalian hunting region, you could say, full of bear people. It was actually more of a it was actually more of a cold northern region. It was very harsh. The people there were very warlike and they did a lot of hunting and gathering. It was it was not exactly a high technology kind of society. Of course Adam Sandler ignored all this and he made it a high technology society. So uh, imagine yourself in the misty, the misty ports of a high technology area that is not supposed to be high technology, populated by turtle people and humans and and uh, relatively few elves and absolutely no bear people, none to be seen whatsoever, even though that was their natural habitat. So yes, uh, uh, joining us was a very small group. A man named Pop-Tart, who I remember nothing about because he was only there temporarily and then showed up. A man named Iggy, who was the star of the entire thing throughout the, throughout the whole duration. He was a total madman, but he carried around with him a pair of what they called Havoc Revolvers, which were the cutting edge in firearm technology. Firearms only recently becoming more popular after they'd figured out a way to protect the firearms from being blown up by magical spells. That was a thing that was a very big deal. Uh, our third character, Mindy the Elf, who stayed with us for a very long time, died repeatedly, but kept coming back as Mindy the Elf. And uh, I believe that was it, except for our NPCs, all run by Adam Sandler, except for when new people showed up. And, and in this case, uh, myself and a friend were playing these two tree people. They, uh, we'll just call them twigs and berries, I cannot recall for the life of me what their real names were because Adam Sandler at that time liked to name all of his characters after anime characters. So uh, he had a daughter, an adopted daughter, named Katara, who also traveled with us. And, no, no, not Katara. Was it Katara? It was the cat thing from, from, from Inuyasha. The cat thing, the big cat thing from Inuyasha. Was it Katara? I don't know. We'll say it's Katara. So anyway though, yes, Katara, Katara the, the obnoxious little, she was a twat. 
but everyone was a twat except for the players. So yes, uh, so yes. Anyway, uh, I uh, uh, when I first joined this game, we were playing little tree people, and so myself, twigs and berries, my friend, my friend berries, myself, twigs, and the way we were introduced to the game is we traveled around. We got separated from the party immediately because for whatever reason, Iggy decided not to let twigs and berries know what was going on. Probably because they were often PCs. Uh, DMPCs, and they were obnoxious twats, as all the DMPCs were. So Iggy didn't trust them. He had no reason to trust them. Iggy went off to go do his own thing. Meanwhile, Twigs and Berries went down to the marketplace to look for trinkets and things to buy with whatever amount of money was in their purse. Which, as it turns out, was not very much, because the DMPC, the, uh, Adam Sandler didn't want to give us a lot of money. And so we went around shopping for a little while, until we we asked, like, well, you know, is there anything interesting that catches our eye? And so sure enough, Adam Sandler, he goes, oh, pfft. No, nothing catches your eye. And then we're like, but we want to buy something. What would be good? Are there any nice weapons? Are there any nice things? Like maybe a blanket. And Adam Sandler goes, oh, yeah, now that you now that you mention it, there's a guy in an alleyway who's selling things. And so we say, oh, hello, sir. We would like to buy some of your wares. Do you have any enchanted items or mystical things? Because these games are often very nerdy. I've never seen these kind of things before. So uh, I approached the man and I said, what do you have to sell? And he goes, oh, I have this mysterious, he goes, I have a mysterious bottle. This man was clearly drunk. He was unshaven. I don't know why Adam Sandler thought that our characters would want to approach him, but he was also homeless. It turned out he was a homeless man selling bottles in the alleyway. <laughs> so, so he said, oh, that's good. A, a mysterious bottle. What does it do? And he goes, well, it can hold stuff. And we say to this man, all right, well, what kind of things can it hold? And he goes, oh, wait a minute. I'll be right back. And so he goes back and he comes back and the bottle is full of urine. And we say, uh, and we say, okay, I'll take it. So we pay this man basically the equivalent of $5, which he's very thankful for. Then we shoot him in the face. We take the $5 back, take the bottle of urine and go back to the airship. That was my first adventure in Children of the Sandler. And uh, basically this was pretty much how the entire game proceeded. Although it got more and more ridiculous the more I got into it. Meanwhile though, Iggy had actually decided to go set off and do his own thing. Iggy was actually, he was a self-proclaimed pirate, but he didn't actually commit piracy. He was more of a burglar uh, slash murderer. And so what he had done is he had decided to go off and just rob a place because he knew that there was no point in talking to the NPCs. The NPCs never did anything good. They never helped us out. They never cut us a good deal. They constantly tried to screw us because uh, Adam Sandler thought we were all stupider than he was. And so he treated us like we were all stupider than he was all the time. And we knew that. So, Iggy set off to go find his own merchant, and he found someone who'd actually closed up their shop. They were, they were not selling for that day, but they were a lovely jewelry shop. So, he set up and decided to try a lockpick skill, which, uh, which he wouldn't actually have very much in the way of lockpicks. And, uh, well, Mindy the Elf kept watch, and Pop-Tart fell asleep at the wheel, uh, which is to say Pop-Tart was supposed to keep watch, but then eventually uh, got distracted and wasn't paying attention during the game. And our rule, uh, our, our rule has always been in every group, that if someone's not paying attention, their character's not paying attention. And so we just completely bypass their round. We're like, oh, oh Pop-Tart, you're ready. Ah, oh, you fumbled the turn. It's someone else's turn now. And so that way, if someone doesn't want to pay attention, then, then they just we just move on. And that way, we don't lose anyone else. It's actually a pretty good policy. So, yes, uh, Pop-Tart falls asleep at the wheel. He's not watching anything. And, uh, and Iggy has no success. This is a common thing. Iggy actually had very few talents. The only thing he could do was shoot people and craft arcane engines. And those are the two things that he was good at, and he stuck to his guns on a regular basis. So, yes, he couldn't pick the locks on this on this uh, doorway, and so instead he just calls, pulls out his gun and decides to shoot away at the lock, which is not a very functional thing, but with Adam Sandler you never know what'll work, and it turns out that that worked quite well. It worked more efficiently than just smashing the window and going in that way. So, he breaks open the door, goes in, starts stashing jewels, and uh, only to have a turtle man show up and demand to know what in the heck is going on. He comes down from upstairs and says, what are you doing? And, uh, and, and at that point, Iggy begins to try to negotiate because Iggy was insane. And he goes, he goes, I'm shopping. And the turtle man says, we're closed. You can't shop here. And he says, well, but I'm a very good shopper. He says, I'm really great at haggling. And the turtle man says, no, you know, he says, we're not haggling. No haggling. We're closed. And he goes, no, no, no. He says, I tell you what, you give me all these diamonds and then I will shoot you in the head, and then I will leave. And the turtle man, the turtle man says, uh, says, well, that doesn't seem like a very good deal. And so sure enough, Iggy makes good on his due. He shoots the turtle man in the head, steals all of his jewels, and then runs back to the ship where twigs and berries are waiting with a bottle of urine. 
<laughs> no explanation there. But twigs and fairies have collected a number of things, and so Iggy asks no questions. He merely suspiciously wonders what the bottle of urine is for. We don't know. We just purchased it and then uh, stole it. So, yes, we take off in our flying airship, which is a thing. They're actually not quite... They're not like what you think. It's not like from Final Fantasy. But the flying airships, they're supposed to be enclosed, but Adam Sandler didn't know this, and so they were more like the the Final Fantasy sort of thing because he liked Final Fantasy and that was what we did. So yes, we take off into the sky and as we pass over the, the ship, it turns out that Iggy had prepared Maltov cocktails. And so he just drops a Maltov cocktail over the side of, over over the side of the ship, onto the shop below where the turtle man had been shot, and sets the place on fire. And away they go. That was the first horrible uh, attack on the place. And that was our first session with Children of the Sandler. And uh, it was probably the least eventful session, and it only got, like I said, it only got much crazier from, from there. I hadn't made an official character yet, but the next time I talk about Children of the Sander, I will tell you about my first character, and that is when the story truly begins. This is only just a sort of introductory warming period as to what Children of the Sandler was really all about. So, uh, that is all I've got today. I believe this has been somewhat of a long video. Uh, I will catch you guys next time.